On today's World Insight, the new Beijing Stock Exchange in the pipeline, new rules, new listing system, the impact on small to medium enterprises and public investors. And from five members to eight, the new Development Bank membership is growing. What does it mean for the international lender's mission? Catching up with NDB President Marco Stroito. By adding new members, you basically just expand the geographical scope. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. We begin with China's newest planned stock exchange in the Chinese capital. The Beijing boards will open in addition to the two existing stock exchanges in Shanghai and Shenzhen. Chinese President Xi Jinping announced the plans for the exchange during last week's China International Fair for Trade and Services. She said the new exchange is set up as the primary platform to service innovation-oriented small and medium-sized enterprises. So why is the Beijing Stock Exchange an idea whose time has come? What does it say about the international financing environment? Let's ask our panelists. For more on the latest with the Beijing Stock Exchange in Beijing, Hong Hao, Managing Director and Head of the Research at Volcom International. Also in Beijing, Li Yong, Senior Fellow with the China Association of International Trade. Last but not least in New York, Anthony Chen, former J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Economist. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. We do not know yet much about the latest rules regarding the Beijing Stock Exchange. Mr. Hong, what do you expect? Well, obviously, you know, because of the strong endorsement from the top, you know, this is the sort of the uh, the fastest uh, development stage for for any exchange in China. I think it's it's going to uh, for for most of us, you know, in the market, you know, we understand it as a complement uh, to uh, the existing stock exchange in Shanghai and Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you know, the new exchange is going to cater uh, to the small and medium enterprise financing. Um, you know, and, and those companies really need more help from uh, the financial sector. Uh, so I think, you know, as far as we know now, you know, yeah. the, the details are still scant, uh, you know, waiting for more, more details to come. One of the things people have been doing over the days uh, since the big news is being announced, Mr. Li, is the comparison between this uh, newly coming Beijing Stock Exchange with those in Shanghai, Shenzhen and even in Hong Kong. What is your take? Um, I think basically this is going to be, very, it is very different uh, from uh, what, uh, from Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Basically, it, uh, it focuses on the financing for the small to medium sized uh, enterprises. And in addition to that, it has a unique three tier system uh, to mm -hmm. really to develop, meaning that. Uh, you know, right now the select tier is going to be listed, and then future uh, listed companies will be chosen from the other two tiers. Basically, from the innovative tiers, uh, you know, which has a total number of uh, over uh, 1,200. And the, currently, the select uh, the number in the category degree of select is just 66. So uh, I think you know the the, the system, uh, listing system is going to be very different. Mr. Chen, for overseas investors, is this a new opportunity? What do you need to know in order to make sure it is an opportunity? Uh, what we see from uh, uh, from the West is that this is somehow a, an opportunity uh, for China to extend uh, the dual circulation policy. Uh, China certainly wants to hedge against uh, possible global uh, shocks in their financial markets and in their overall economy. Mm -hmm. And also these small and medium-sized companies uh, in the past have had difficulty borrowing money 
from Chinese banks. And so now this creates great opportunity for them to actually uh, list in the in the equity markets and allow them to grow. One of the things Mr. Chan many would ask, what kind of uh, overseas investors would be interested in, you know, things like uh, the Beijing Stock Exchange as it claims to be? Do, can you be more specified? Yes, what we're hearing or what we're seeing uh, is that somehow there's a movement uh, towards uh, developing a lot of the companies that uh, have an innovative uh, uh, type of uh, uh, emphasis and moving away from the super large uh, tech companies. These companies obviously offer great potential growth, but also mm -hmm. great risk. So I think that the overseas investors would be happy uh, to look at these companies, but probably in a portfolio or in a group of them, because let's face it, if they're small, and they are, uh, they're going to be a lot okay. more risky. So you want to invest in sort of a portfolio of these companies rather than one or two, because obviously not all of these companies are going to be super successful. But again, okay. uh, investing in, in a portfolio manner would be uh, something I think that, that would be exciting. Uh, this is an interesting development because, you know, it is going to uh, really resolve the dilemma of the Chinese high-tech, small, medium-sized companies having to go to NASDAQ, for example, to get the financing. So this is an opportunity. But they could the go to Shanghai, could go to Shenzhen, and could go to Hong no, Kong. No, 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 they are, they are totally how, how, different. How come is this in, going in, to be different? Because, you know, in Shanghai and in Shenzhen, the requirement is so different. You know, there's certain threshold that those companies, you know, small, medium-sized companies cannot really reach. Mm. And that is the reason they are not listed. Okay, in the pub, uh, in the the other two stock exchanges. Mr. Hong, would you like to respond to that? Uh, is it really going to be that much of an opportunity as the uh, Mr. Lee just uh, claimed? It remains to be seen. I think for now, you know, many of the promising, more promising SMEs are getting, you know, different of financing rounds, you know, from uh, PE investment firms, right? Very true. So you know, each each round of financing uh, finance raising, uh, they revalue the company upwards so by the time they get to the market you know the, the valuation multiple would be like so high that it's almost prohibitive for, for for normal investors to participate you know because it's just too expensive so I think you know getting the public financing into these companies uh, at an earlier stage it will actually allow um, a more uh, sort of a, a bigger participation uh, of the general public uh, into the funding of, of high-tech growth in China. Mm. So I think t for that purpose, uh, you know, this stock exchange, the new stock exchange actually serves a really good purpose. For the new tech board uh, listed in, Sh in Shanghai, uh, there is a, a, a rather restrictive uh, investment uh, hurdle, you know, for people to participate. So you need to have a certain amount of balance in your trading mm. account, you know, so to, you know, to prove that you are uh, eligible to, uh, to put money in, in those companies. Mm. And I wouldn't be surprised to see sort of a, a more restrictive uh, investment hurdle, you know, for, for people to money, put money in this new exchange. But having said that, you know, many of the, the smaller firms, you know, they don't even have earnings, right? So right. many of them don't even have revenue, I don't know. So it is, you, you're right, you know, it is kind of risky, you know, for, for general public to, to participate without so, knowing the specific risk. Mr. Hong, you since you've been in the stock uh, market, uh, shall I say, field for quite long, let me just follow up by asking you, you know, Shanghai, for example, you see uh, some of the Shanghai Stock Exchange boards uh, earlier have very restrictive uh, measures. For example, companies have to make profits at what threshold in order to be continue to be listed at the stock exchange. But later, over the years, it relaxed that. Um, as long as they are meeting certain kinds of priorities, you know, how should we understand with the issue of innovation, of creativity, the so-called danger and the uh, possibility, once again? Mm. Yeah, I was on the review board uh, for the uh, new tech board in Shanghai uh, before it, it, it was launched. You know, back then the concern was that, you know, some of, of the companies, you know, don't even have earnings and therefore the valuation is difficult to calculate. And right. also it, it can become very speculative, uh, you know, because you don't have the, the trading, uh, daily trading limits anymore, right? So on the first day of trading, you know, you, you have no limit. And then on the second day onwards, you have 30% up or downside uh, trading limit, which is substantially wider uh, than the existing uh, stock exchange. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rules like that, you know, we, uh, 
in the you know many many of many people in the Chinese stock market hasn't even experienced. You know, back in the early '90s, there wasn't any trading limits at all, and the stock market was very volatile. And I think that's the reason why uh, the authority put in the trading limit. Uh, so I think you know your concerns are legitimate, uh, and I think the details are still being sorted out. But I wouldn't be surprised to see you know um, more sort of a restrictive criteria. Mm -hmm. For people to be qualified uh, to invest in, in this new stock exchange, well, journalists always tend to be more critical than most of the investors. So that's for sure. <laughs> we are in very different trades, I guess, uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, the initial batch of of listed companies are supposed to be uh, more resilient, uh, more uh, uh, you know controllable mm -hmm. in terms of risk because. You know, these 60 companies, even though they are small in number, but their total uh, volume of trade in the old uh, national equity exchange and quotation system, uh, they account for over nearly 75% of the trading value right. and about 40% of the trading volume uh, of the trading uh, uh, of the transaction. So uh, I think the initial start uh, is not going to be as risky. And the, down the road, I think the, the regulatory uh, bodies, you know, I think they are going to, uh, you know, monitor, watch and adjust their policy. Mr. Chan, uh, when we see China's uh, capital market reform and also China's financial reform. How do you see this could be one of those steps for overseas investors? All you have to do is to look at what happened to these 66 companies on the first day that the announcement was made that a Beijing exchange was going to be created. Now, the prices did not go down, they went up. Mm -hmm. So even locally, the excitement is there. And I think that if that excitement continues, foreign investors will pay attention to that excitement and certainly uh, would want to participate, assuming that they were allowed to participate. But once again, uh, participating in a mutual fund type of format where you gather a portfolio of these companies would probably be the right uh, step yeah. because many of these companies obviously are much riskier than the companies that we see in the Shanghai Exchange where the large capitalization companies uh, uh, have found a home. Right. Another thing, Mr. Chen, just to follow up about that, you know, people are doing comparison for international investors. It's obviously the whole world, the stock exchanges is, are, are the options on their plate. So in Beijing, if it starts, what does that mean? Uh, how much of an option? Uh, what details do you think investors like you would really look into before you make the decision? certainly want to see uh, what the uh, uh, history of corporate profits, the accounting records, that has always been uh, right. a bit controversial. But if you get information, uh, good accounting information of profits and revenues, that is something that uh, international investors will certainly be interested in. And if that information is forthcoming, there will be uh, quite right. a bit of excitement. Both the China's uh so-called inner circulation and outer circulation uh, issue, and also China's finance reform vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's going on in the negotiations between China and the United States and China and Europe. A lot of things are actually in the backdrop. How do you see really this decision being made in that much bigger context? Uh, the chairman of, of CSRC actually you know, announced mm -hmm. that you know the uh, uh, the opening of the Chinese financial market is going to be further and, and deeper than what it is now. Uh, so I think it, it, it's trying to inspire uh, the confidence from uh, foreign capital. You know, after months of, of sell off in the Chinese market, uh, and then I think at the same time, you know, the dual circulation strategy really is sort of um, um, the grander scale of things going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because ever, ever since a pandemic, um, I think you know um, the domestic demand hasn't been as strong as we hope. But then you know the um, the export sector of China is going full steam, you know, because, you know, China is one of the few countries left, you know, mm. who can still produce at full capacity. All right. So I think going forward, you know, more and more countries will realize this and 
you know, try to relocate production facilities overseas. Uh, so as a result, you know, getting funding, getting investments, you know, in the in the physical economy could be a bit more tricky uh, than than before. So you know, the dual circulation strategy is you know devised uh, under such circumstances, you know, to, to sort of anticipate, you know, what is going to happen uh, in the future. So I think, you know, being, you know, part of the dual circulation strategy, you know, having a a solid inter and, and, and sort of a liquid internal financing market mm -hmm. is the key as well, especially, you know, you know these SMEs, you know, it's it's almost inscrutable from outside, you know, it, it's very difficult for people, for people to understand their, uh, their growth trajectory and the accounting practice and all that, you know, it, even for a domestic investors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the old, the, the, the Xinjiang Bank, you know, the, the new board uh, that launched in, in Beijing a couple of years ago wasn't a huge success, you know, because, you know, many of the numbers, the accounting numbers are inscrutable uh, yeah. uh, to the domestic investment uh, public. So I think going forward, you know, hopefully, you know, many of these things can be changed uh, and hopefully uh, this new exchange can fit into nicely uh, into the uh, uh, dual circulation strategy going forward. Mm. Mr. Li, I want to also jump to your expertise. Uh, when it comes to trade, of course, uh, you've been doing a lot of research about trade policies and things. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how much do you see the potential, of course, this is a very big topic, the potential of China uh, doing trade on the earlier terms with the rest of the world? And how much do you see China really have to uh, in a way, rely on its its own market, uh, including the stock markets, to generate the new blood, quote unquote. Um, I have to say that dual circulation, um, domestic circulation, and uh, and external circulation does not really exclude each one another. So, in that sense, I think you know trade uh, will not uh, rely on the willingness or the preparedness of Chinese companies, you know, to whether they would they want to participate more mm -hmm. uh, domestically or less internationally. I don't think I this see. is the case. So external environment is going to be the uh, determinant mm -hmm. of how the trade is going to, to, to perform. And this, uh, you know, this new stock exchange in terms of domestic circulation, I think it is going to inject uh, a kind of a, a financial stimulus for small to medium sized companies because you know if you look at this the the structure of the economy okay. small to medium sized companies account you know uh, a majority of the of the uh, economic entities 90 percent of the companies in china big or small are kind of a small to medium sized companies so they are important they need to develop if they develop you know, the economy is going to develop and the domestic circulation is going to be to be heading towards a healthy uh, trajectory. This okay. is my take. Mm. Mr. Chen, final words. Final word is that I think that the Chinese government is trying its best uh, to create as much uh, as much as much opportunity as possible for more people, for more investors and for more smaller uh, for these smaller companies. So. I think in the long run, it's a positive development and not something to be worried about, uh, because if more people can participate in this common prosperity, yeah. how could that be a bad thing? All right. You know, one of the things the most important is investors ask, are you going to invest in that stock exchange if it comes into being? I have to ask uh, every one of you one by one. Mr. Hong? It really depends. Uh, <laughs> as an economist, you know, that's a standard <laughs> economist answer. I know. Right? So it really depends on, you know, whether we can find, you know, good companies to invest in, in the new stock exchange. Right. And let's hope uh, things go that way. Okay. You've already given that on the one hand, on the other hand, answer almost uh, by an economist. What about for you, Mr. Chan? You're also an economist. What's your answer? The answer is absolutely yes. If oh. we have the uh, available information that we have for other Western companies? Okay. Absolutely, yes. Mr. Lee? Yes, I think, you know, <laughs> when I'm able to participate, you know, there will be, I think, uh, you know, a situation when those in, in, institutional players uh, are giving us a kind of a bigger, uh, better environment. 
and then I will uh, definitely participate in. So there is precondition. I can read that. Uh, thank you so much, <laughs> the three of you, for joining us. Uh, Li Yong, Hong Hao, Anthony Chen, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Coming up, from five members to eight, the new development bank membership is growing. What does it mean for the international lenders' mission? Catching up with the NDB president, Marcos Trejo, next. By adding new members, you basically just expand the geographical scope. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. This year's BRICS Leaders Meeting is being held virtually on Thursday. Right before the convention, the BRICS New Development Bank has announced the United Arab Emirates, Uruguay, and Bangladesh are its three new members. Headquarters in Shanghai, the founding NDB members are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. As the development lender for emerging economies, the NDB's first membership expansion speaks of its global outreach mission. So with new members joining in, what direction is the bank heading for? And what does it mean for investors? For answers, I talked to Marcos Trejo, the NDB president. Let's listen in. Mr. President, what a pleasure to see you. It's great to see you, Tianwei. Very, very good to join your program again. Thank you, sir. And congratulations on enrolling new members, three of them from different parts of the world, into the new development bank members. Tell me more about why the decision. Well, Tianwei, the, when, when Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa set up the new development bank, they did not want to make it exclusively a uh, uh, a club for the BRICS. They wanted it to be a very efficient tool for the world of development for emerging economies. So at one point in the in the future, membership expansion would get started. And we're very happy to announce uh, uh, this last couple of days that this process has indeed begun. The train has left the station and we have uh, announced the admission of three uh, new members. So we are started uh, the process to live up to the very name of our institution, mm -hmm. which is a new development bank. And now we have admitted um, the United Arab Emirates, Uruguay, and Bangladesh as, as new members. So it's an important milestone for the bank, especially in a global juncture where there is such a lot of disconnect, being able to add more countries into a platform for, our co for cooperation, for the mobilization of resources that are geared to development. I think is indeed an important uh, milestone. So we're very happy about it. Mm, I can tell the excitement uh, from the lights in your eyes, uh, sir. But, you know, there's one question. With all of these members joining in who are not necessarily uh, the largest emerging economies, where is going to be the bank's direction, future directions? And are we going to see more new members joining in? On what kind of timetable? Well, uh, Tianwei, I think the direction here is very is very clear. Uh, this is, is supposed to be a, a new development bank embracing more and more economies of the world. Of course, membership uh, is open to whichever uh, countries are part of the United Nations system. But as we go forward, we wanted to learn from the uh, experience of other institutions and make the process both gradual and, and balanced. We want to make sure that those that are joining the bank are actually able to enjoy the kind of resources uh, we put together for infrastructure, for, for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So once again, we want to make it a gradual process. Right now, we, we have uh, admitted uh, three new members. So as, as everyone knows, the United Arab Emirates, uh, which is joining the bank at uh, non-borrowing status, mm -hmm. is one of the most dynamic and innovative economies of the world. It's an economy that has diversified over the, uh, the past few decades. It's become a global hub for finance, for tourism, for technology, for research, for innovation. And uh, it's joining us uh, when it celebrates its 50th anniversary as, as a nation state, which is a great honor for us. Uruguay uh, has a long tradition in uh, multilateral economic institutions. 
uh, those who have been uh, studying uh, trade know that uh, the general agreement on tariffs and trade closed with the so-called Uruguay round of negotiations. That's right. They have also a very important experience in leading multilateral development institutions. The, the Uruguay had one president of the Inter-American Development Bank in the past. And the 2021 is, I think, an important year because according to the projections of the International Monetary Fund, uh, Uruguay will be South America's number one GDP uh, per capita in, in, in nominal terms. So a very important addition to the bank. It creates also uh, great opportunities for um, um, joint projects with some of our member countries. Uruguay and Brazil uh, are border countries. So in terms of logistics, transportation, energy, there's, there's a lot that can be invested there. Mm -hmm. And we're also announcing Bangladesh. Tianwei, Bangladesh is the fastest growing country in the fastest growing region of the world, which is Asia. It's one of the top 30 economies of the world mm -hmm. in terms of gross domestic product uh, measured in purchasing uh, power parity terms. It's, it's done a lot in terms of poverty alleviation. It's done a lot in terms of raising living standards, life expectancy at birth. It's got huge infrastructure needs. So I think a major, very important addition to the new development bank. And they are also joining the bank in the year they celebrate the 50th anniversary of their independence. Mm -hmm. So another historical milestone for us and for Bangladesh. Mm. When you say the United Arab Emirates is joining as a non-borrowing partner, what would that mean? And what is going to be the status differentially among the three when they're joining the bank? And how are they contributing to the bank, both financially and also in providing more solutions to some of the challenges the bank is trying to deal with for emerging economies as a whole? Yeah, so, so the UAE is a very high income country. The UAE uh, participates in other multilateral institutions also at non-borrowing status. That means it invests in that particular institution but doesn't necessarily take loans uh, from it. It participates in, in, in the staff of that institution. It may take up uh, uh, leading positions in that institution. Mm -hmm. Its companies can participate in the procurement uh, process of, of that institution. So it's, it's a very important uh, contribution, especially because the UAE has had a tremendous successful experience recently in providing for its own infrastructure for providing for uh, more value addition to its GDP. Right. So there's a lot that, uh, that we're going to benefit from the presence of the, uh, of the UAE. Is uh, the UAE the, going uh, to contribute to the fund that were early established by the five emerging economies? In what way, to what extent, how much, on what timetable? Yeah. yeah, so uh, every, every new member uh, of, the, of the new development bank joins the institution by providing some paid in capital. So mm -hmm. this is done over a period of, of, of seven years. So it allows for a more robust capital structure of, of the new development bank. But that does not uh, uh, preclude us from uh, looking uh, for other sources of, of, of resources. As a matter of fact, we have a clear direction from our board in the sense that we should bring in more uh, capital from, from private sources. Mm -hmm. What does this mean, you know, vis-a-vis -vis some of your partners and counterparts, such as AIIB, and such as even on a bigger uh, format, uh, the uh, World Bank? Well, I think, uh, you see, there is there is uh, more room for everyone to grow in reality, especially Tianwei, if you take into account that the needs of infrastructure investment around the world, mm -hmm. particularly in emerging countries, is in the trillions of dollars. Think, think about what's necessary in terms of water, sanitation, energy efficiency. I, I mean, really, we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars demand for uh, infrastructure investment in the emerging economies. Where is the model lateral the development banks mm -hmm. combined? I mean, take every one of them into consideration. So the World Bank, uh, you take uh, and, and its family of institutions, so the International uh, Finance Corporation. If you, if you take into account the AIIB, which, are, which is our sister institution, set up more or less at the same time. If all of them are uh, put together, you only have uh, have about three to four percent of all of the uh, infrastructure needs. So there's right. a huge gap. There's a huge distance between needs, demands, and what is provided by multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. And there is another element well, as well, which is sometimes multilateral development banks work in areas 
where, uh, say, uh, traditional private capital institutions would have an initial interest. But because there is a pilot project that works, mm -hmm. that sets up the example, then other investors crowd in and they multiply the benefit that comes from those kind of activities. So sure. it, it's a very important work and there's there's room for everyone. But, but Mr. President, I, I'm sure you are aware of the fact that among the five emerging economies who are the founding members of the new development bank, uh, situations of their economic uh, growth rate and the landscape very different now uh, since the establishment of the new development bank. How do you see now a very different and diversified, you could, I could use a neutral word, uh, of the economic landscape and reality? What would that mean for new development bank, your immediate and near future planning? Well, uh, Tianwei, that is true about the uh, founding members of, of the New Development Bank. That is basically true about any other grouping around the world. Look at look at the G7, for example, over over the past few decades, that how, there has also been a, a marked difference. In the case of the NDB, the most important element putting these countries together is that they have interests that co they, that coincide when it comes to mobilizing resources and ideas for sustainable development. Mm -hmm and for infrastructure. And I would say this is a very powerful bond. Uh, uh, we we, uh, we uh, work together, we roll up our sleeves every day with the biggest emerging economies of the world, acting exactly on those areas in which the interests uh, uh, coincide. And I don't think that's going to change. By, by adding new members, you basically just expand the geographical scope of that rolling up of sleeves, of that, of that joint work, because that is a need that's felt throughout the uh, the entire emerging mm. uh, uh, country uh, universe. So I think the cooperation potential there actually only tends to get bigger. You know, Mr. President, I was trying to imagine before coming into the studio how you are going to do your work. I mean, since the bank was founded a few years ago until now, things have changed so much in terms of geopolitics, in terms of the relations bilaterally among your founding members. I wouldn't name their names, you know the complexity. So I'm thinking, hmm, how would President Choi Jo work every day to bring all these consensus together? Well, you know, you know Tian Wei, sometimes I love to study very much the origin of words, and you've, uh, <laughs> you've just mentioned the word there that I, that I particularly uh, admire, which is the word consensus. Mm -hmm. So consensus means uh, moving in, in the same uh, direction, towards the same goals. And we have we have many goals as, as as sovereign nations that are that are the same. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. This is uh, 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 this needs to take center stage, and that is why I think we're able to build a cooperation in those uh, areas. And and besides, I mean the kind of uh, uh, interests that converge when it comes to infrastructure investment here. There are many other interests that are there when you look even at the bilateral aspects of the relationship between. Uh, some of our member countries. Uh, mm. I, I've, I've already uh, spoken to you, for example, in the case of Brazil and China. Uh, 20 years ago, Brazil-China bilateral trade was a billion dollars a year. Today, Brazil-China trade is a billion dollars every 60 hours. I know. So the level of exchange, and you also see that when, when it comes to India and China, when it comes to India and Russia, uh, the world is, as you have very correctly put, is living a world of, of more, uh, say, uh, there, there's, a, there's a lack, a deficit of, of cooperation, mm -hmm. but we are there playing our role counter cyclically of, of providing <laughs> a platform for these countries to come together. Good for you. <laughs> Very courageous, I guess, when you're saying that. But when you're saying that word, I also want to learn the origin, convergence, uh, the convergence of interest. Maybe that's a very important word to take away. You see some of your member economies, uh, China, for example, since we are talking uh, uh, based in Beijing, uh, see its new idea of establishing more stock exchanges besides the Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and now they, it's adding Beijing. So you see this vibrant scene where at the same time there are investors also talking about whether China is still as welcoming to investors as it used to be, as innovative as it used to be. Mr. President, you know, this is only one of your founding members. So how do you deal and see, you know, all these uh, uh, around the clock changes among your founding members about the future directions of their economy and investment environment? 
Well, uh, you see, one of the ways to interpret the effects of COVID uh, in the world, uh, Tianwei, and th that I favor the most, is that the world actually uh, pushed the pause button. Uh, some observers out there even say that we are not, uh, for this past year and a half, we have not experienced a great recession, mm -hmm. but we have experienced a great intermission. So things uh, took sort of a pause. For example, I remember looking at some numbers in early uh, 2020 when Antad was uh, uh, publicizing the results of flows of foreign direct investment in the previous year, in 2019. And, and I guess at the time, China was about to overtake the United States as the top destination for world FDI. Mm -hmm. And Brazil was number four. Uh, so uh, housing about 75 billion uh, new foreign direct investment in, uh, in 2019. So all of that has taken sort of a, a, a pause because of COVID. But going forward, as as vaccination is, is rolled out, as economic normality uh, somewhat resumes, then the flows of FDI will continue to, in to increase. And I think uh, many of our member countries are mindful of this very important paradox that you see in the world out there. Because mm -hmm. uh, as you were saying, uh, as a result of more uncertainty, as a result of people living longer, as a result of the demassification of the economy, you have a huge amount of of savings of resources that are looking for good investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And other, on the other hand, you have less projects, less interesting ideas that are able to absorb those uh, kind of, of savings and investment in the form of, of economic activity. So I think uh, as, once again, situation goes back to something that's closer to normality, right. there's going to be more and more creative instruments to attract that liquidity, some of them in the form of new stock exchanges, some of them put together by institutions like ourselves because we want to mobilize more private capital uh, to uh, to be able to direct those resources to our right. member countries. So I, I, I see I see it as a natural I see it as a natural consequence of the world that is progressively going to resume normality and therefore the overall flows of investment will also expand. I want to follow up on that, particularly the new development bank's future potential in cooperation with the private sector. I remember, Mr. President, you said in a recent business summit uh, very uh, clearly that that is the potential. Do you have a timetable and also the amount of cooperation you want to have with and what conditions do we line it up already in front of the private sector? Yeah, so we, we, we have already a number of projects that are done in partnership with the, with the private sector. We, we, have, we have so uh, those in, in Russia, we have those in, 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 in Brazil. We wanted to have in, in all of our member countries, we want a considerable portion of our portfolio to be taken up by projects in the, in the private sector. And we want to do a lot of cross-institutional uh, financing. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one particular a project where you have a multilateral institution like us, another multilateral institution, an investment fund that's led by private uh, in investors, we can now come together. I give you one very uh, interesting example. For example, sure. uh, the, the, the NDB uh, has a, a big uh, investment uh, share, a big financing share of a project in, in Brazil for, for solar panels that actually sets up the biggest uh, solar uh, uh, power generation uh, unit in, in Latin America. And there in that project, you have, we have our share, other, uh, we, we have other development banks participating, and we have investors from, from the private sector as well. This is the kind of opportunity that we're very much open to. Uh, now, in, during my term, we have set up the uh, non-sovereign uh, department here in, in our uh, vice presidency for operations. I so see. people who are exclusively directed to private sector operations, along with the new department for ESG. So mm -hmm. we are we are very mindful of, of these, say, preferences on the part of investors to have very strong criteria for environment, social and governments. So we're also making the institution more sophisticated to be able to play a constructive role in whichever projects we do with the private sector. Among your founding members, there are already currency swap schemes. And also, uh, within the programs that you have, there are also different kinds of uh, currency programs and bonds. Tell me more about your choices and preferences of currencies as things goes, uh, goes by. I think our role here is to allow for more, uh, a, more a bigger basket uh, of, of choices that are available for, for whoever does business with us. We have a mandate and a priority in, a, in our set of objectives to do more local currency financing, do away with the exchange rate risk. Uh, we, we do so once again in a very progressive manner uh, as global interest rates uh, 
also move towards some sort of uh, normality. Uh, this mm -hmm. should be this should this should be a bigger a bigger option. We absolutely have that as as a priority and as an option mm -hmm. for for those who want to work with projects in 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 the NDB. We, we're not uh, we cannot be a new development bank only in the name of our institution. We have to have new uh, investment and financing practices as well. Local currency financing is definitely one of them. Marcos Troyho, the president of the New Development Bank. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Inside, check our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.